con eh, Hans. Hans nos va a platicar sobre detección de fraudes en servicios financieros utilizando Graph Analysis y Machine Learning con tecnología de Oracle. Él es eh, eh, director de Product Management en Oracle y pues nos va a dar la sesión en inglés. Si tienen preguntas, las pueden escribir en español. Y Fabián, que está aquí conmigo, él puede ayudarnos a leerlas y compartirlas. Igualmente voy a estar yo acá. Yo soy Rolando Carrasco y soy parte del equipo de LAUC. Les agradecemos que hayan estado eh, pendientes de la agenda del evento y que estén participando en él. La presentación está siendo grabada por si alguien la quiere volver a ver. La vamos a compartir días después de que termine el evento. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Hans. I just introduced you for the audience. Uh, thank you again for your support, and we are very glad to have you as part of our agenda. So you may start now. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. And um, also a warm welcome from my side. First of all, apologies uh, that I seem to be sitting in the dark. We did have the camera to work, and it looks like it was working, um, uh, but somehow it is not. It is not quite as late in my place that it would already be dark. Um, that said, I am based in Hamburg in Germany, uh, so I'm a couple of hours in terms of time zone away from probably most of you. It's a great pleasure for me to be um, on the LAOUC community, community tour. That's actually a first for me. Um, I have been presenting at quite a few Oracle user group conferences over the, the years. I think my first one was at DOAC, the German Oracle user group, in 1998. I'm almost ashamed to say. Um, and since then, I've been sort of presenting in many places. Um, unfortunately, I do not speak Spanish. Uh, uh, both my daughters do, but I don't. I'm sorry about this. Uh, so I will have to be presenting in English. Um, uh, the topic, as you just heard, will be fraud detection using graph analysis and machine learning. I will be using customer references and examples from financial services, but even if you're not working in that industry, I hope that the talk will still be interesting because you know many of the problems will be applicable in some way, shape or form to other domains as well. And even if you're not familiar with graph technologies, you should still be able to uh, take away you know, the fundamentals from this talk. And uh, before I forget, right, to reduce the risk of death by PowerPoint, I will show you um, what our tools look like in practice. So stay tuned for the live demo. Now, typically, I'm not particularly good at monitoring the chat and everything at the same time. Uh, and in, in my case, I actually have the additional challenge that I'm, I'm uh, using two screens and things are all over the place. So uh, maybe, Fabian, if you could notify me if there's any chat or if there's any issue, if there's any sound problem or whatever, right, do let me know. Um, also, if I'm speaking too fast or whatever, right? Good. So, off we go. Now, before we before we actually start, let me do one thing. Let me just briefly put things uh, uh, into into context. Uh, I mean, I guess most of you know about Oracle being a converged database, right? Just to let you know, the graph technologies which I will be talking about in my presentation, they are part of the multimodal capabilities of the Oracle database, uh, right? You can use Oracle as a, as a document store, as a spatial analysis platform, as a machine learning engine, and so on. And the graph technologies are an integral part of that. And what they specifically offer, and what makes them special, is that graph technologies give you a different view on your existing data, right? Which means that they enable you to basically to generate value from your data in ways you couldn't do before. And I, I hope it'll become clear what that means in the next few minutes. Right? There are two more things which I would like to uh, briefly mention here. One, the graph features are available in all editions of the Oracle database and all relevant cloud services without additional license cost. Right? No charges any longer for the graph technologies. And two, we're supporting two different graph models. Right? In, in this session, in today's session, we'll be covering what is known as property graphs, 
But besides property graphs, we also have a graph model, which is based on the so-called resource description framework, or RDF for short, uh, which you may have come across in the context of the semantic web, right? We already implemented support for RDF knowledge graphs many years ago, and we're continuing to enhance that functionality. But that's not the topic for today, right? If you're more interested in semantic technologies, I'll give you a couple of links at the very end of this talk uh, with further information on our graph technologies, and that'll include the RDF technologies, okay? Right, so much for the introduction. Now, let's get started with what a graph database is in the first place, right? Okay, technically speaking, what makes a graph database special is that it explicitly stores relationships between data entities, right? That makes them particularly useful if you want to discover and understand relationships. Right now, what does that mean? Let, you give, let me give you an example. Let's assume that you have bank transaction data in a relational format, like what we've got here, right? We have a customer table, we have an account table, we have a transaction table. And let's assume that you want to answer two questions. First question, is there any money flow between Bob and Charlie, right? Okay, let me just quickly see if I can highlight that here, right? So let's take the laser pointer, right? So we have Bob here, that's customer C2, and Charlie, customer three C, uh, C3, right? And they have uh, one or more accounts. Uh, and then you have all these transactions. And now the question is, is there a money flow between Bob and Charlie? And when I say transaction uh, money flow, that doesn't necessarily mean that Bob transfers money directly to Charlie, but a money flow would be from Bob to someone else, to maybe someone else, to maybe someone else, and then to Charlie, right? That's the first question. Is there any money flow between Bob and Charlie? Second question, are there clusters of transactions? That is, is there a pattern of frequent transactions among a group of accounts, while at the same time, there are none or very few between that group and the remaining accounts, right? Clustering as, as, as you would know it, right? Is there a cluster of transactions? Now to answer the first question, can do that, of course, in a, in a relational model, right? You need a, a number of joins and self-joins between the tables, uh, but that's doable. It's not easy, but it's doable. Answering the second question about clusters of transactions, that is a bit harder. It would likely require a little bit of, you know, PL SQL, uh, and then, uh, you know, you would then try to construct a graph and uh, determine the clusters and, and so on. Right? Now let's see how this could be answered using a graph database. Right? If you look at the little um, uh, graphic here on the left-hand side, right, with Bob here and Charlie here, if these, what we call vertices, these dots um, represent their accounts, if you represent this um, in this way, you can immediately see, ah, there is a path from A1 to A3 to A5 to A4. So there is a money flow between Bob and Charlie, right, with the edges here being directed edges and representing the money transfers. So what we've done here is we've represented the accounts as vertices. We have represented the transactions as edges in this graph. And then already from the visual representation, you can immediately see, ah, there is a money flow between Bob and Charlie, right? It's just a simple example of pathfinding, right? Is there a path between account A1 and A4, right? Um, and you can also use that same approach to look for other patterns, you know, like cycles in the graph, right? Circular transfers, which, you know, if you have a relational database, that typically gives you a hard time, right? Or um, uh, um, if, you, if you want to use that uh, approach, um, somehow, I mean, the first step always needs to be that you need to convert your tabular model to such a graph, right? And what that means and how that works, um, uh, I'll, I'll show you in, in just a moment, right? That's how we would tackle the, uh, the pathfinding question in a graph database. That would be the first question. To answer the second question, so the question about clusters in transactions, we actually need a graph algorithm, right? That 
that process in graph theory is known as community detection. And from graph theory, there's a large number of algorithms out there that can generally help you to provide additional insight in, in these kinds of situations, right? Besides the community detection, um, which you know, allows you to identify bank accounts that belong to the same community, where mostly they transfer money between each other, which is what we're looking for here. But there are also like ranking and centrality algorithms that help you to determine which bank, bank accounts are more important based on the the number or the nature of their connections to other accounts, or there are, again, pathfinding or connectivity algorithms that help you to detect patterns. Um, there are link prediction algorithms. Uh, there are similarity algorithms. All of that um, is well known, well documented, uh, and uh, uh, typically available in these kinds of graph databases. Right now. Some people tend to think that these graph technologies can only tackle very specific use cases, like social network analysis is one thing which people tend to associate with it. But graphs can actually be used for tons of other things, right? You can essentially model anything as a graph. I'm not saying you should, but you could, right? And if we look at some of the typical use cases around fraud, risk, compliance and so on, you can see that graphs typically come into play when connections play a role, right? So in, in fraud prevention, right, when you analyze money flows in networks of financial transactions, they can help you to find those cases where you have collusive crime, right? So like in, in the case of money laundering schemes, where money flows from one starting account through several steps back to the starting account, right? These kind of circular money transfers, they're always indicative of something funny going on, or typically are. Um, or in risk management, right? When you are a bank and you're onboarding a new customer, then as part of what is known as the know your customer process, you typically want to check if that new customer is connected to, let's say, a Russian oligarch who's on uh, on some blacklist or something, right? Again, this is all about indirect uh, connections or indirect connections. Or when we look at compliance, like you know, GDPR compliance, the um, uh, General Data Protection Regulation in the European Union, and you're trying to figure out, for example, which user has access to a certain column in the database that uh, stores personally identifiable information. In that case, you want to find out in your hierarchy of you know, roles and privileges and other dependencies whether there is a connection between that user and the column in the table. Right? Or finally, uh, when you need to figure out how a given KPI is calculated, for example, as part of the Solvency II regulations in the insurance industry, uh, then you know you need to provide details of the data lineage, which essentially means you need to track the path which the data took in order to arrive at the calculation that led to this KPI, right? So in summary, graphs are always particularly well suited for the analysis of either networks or relationships, like indirect relationships in particular, hierarchies, or like what you have in dependencies, for instance, or paths. And you know, paths could be you know, processing flows, for example. Right? These are the use cases in fraud, risk, and compliance in particular. But of course, be besides fraud, risk, and compliance, there's lots of other use cases in financial services where these kinds of data structures occur, right? or where graphs can help like in customer 360 analysis for targeted marketing, or when you do dependency analysis in your IT infrastructure, right? What happens if I change this library, which is part of that um, uh, solution, which is part of, uh, which is running on that server, which is in turn being used by that other server? You know, these kinds of dependencies and indirect relationships in in uh, IT infrastructure, or if you want to do malware detection in uh, IP networks and so on, right? So 
there's mm -hmm. loads of use cases in, in all kinds of industries. Right. Now, among the customers that are using these graph features in the Oracle database, and you know, who also kindly shared more details about how they do this, we have a global e-payments provider, a company called Paysafe. Right? Paysafe are actually quite a big player in this space. Uh, they have two brands, Skrill and Nutella, um, and they're offering e-wallets, and they're processing up to like you know 500,000 payments every day. Now, they started a, a graph project a while back, and when they started the project, they essentially had three objectives. One, they needed to improve the accuracy of their real-time transaction monitoring system. Two, they wanted to reduce the amount of manual work they have in the fraud department. And three, they needed a solution that seamlessly integrated with their operational systems, which on the one hand uh, are based on, on Oracle and on the other hand um, are using Microsoft, right? And as a provider of these online payments, they always need to strike that balance between thorough fraud analysis on the one hand, because for every fraudulent transaction which a credit card company gets involved in, they uh, have to, you know, uh, uh, pay chargebacks so that they want to minimize the chargebacks. On the other hand, they of course don't want to upset their customers, right? If they um, if they uh, reject a perfectly legal transaction because of a false positive in their uh, uh, transaction monitoring system, that of course annoys the customer and they need to find that balance, right? Um, so key for them was uh, they came to the conclusion that if they wanted to do more thorough fraud analysis, they needed to use graphs because in their network of transactions between these e-wallets, they needed to find suspicious patterns more more quickly, essentially, and more accurately uh, than, than before, right? And one indicator, for example, which they used was if there was an account which had been involved in some kind of fraudulent activity previously, and that was somehow related to the target account of a given transaction, then they would flag this transaction as too risky, right? Uh, but that was the initial solution, right? They created a graph where they had all their e-wallets and their uh, transactions between them, so they knew which, con which accounts were connected by transactions and they would use that to identify new patterns, right? That was the one thing they did for online, for real-time transaction monitoring. At the same time, they used the same graph for the folks in their fraud department together with a visualization solution, which could then you know, graphically render this network of transactions. You know, and then they could look at the network of transactions around a given account which they were currently investigating, for example, right? And even that relatively simple tool reduced the amount of manual effort quite a bit and saved them a lot of money. Right? And then at a later stage, they added more data to the to the graph, right? They had account data, device data, location data, and, and so forth. And then they started to combine the graph database also with machine learning capabilities, but I'll, I'll talk about that later on, right? Maybe just quickly before we move on, the reason why they decided in favor of um, the Oracle platform was, was there were actually, actually three reasons. One was simply performance, because we scale very well. We are very fast with our graph technologies. Two, they liked our query language, because it was simple and at the same powerful, uh, at the same time powerful. And three, uh, they, they liked the integration with their existing data warehouse infrastructure. Okay, so that's what the PaySafe guys did. They kindly shared two examples of fraudulent patterns which they show uh, which they saw in their data right on the left hand side what you can see is a a typical example of what they refer to as layering right if you if you look at that that graph every every vertex here every dot is an e wallet right and every edge is a money transfer and what you can see here is you have this e wallet here and that is being used to transfer money here, but somehow 
the money is transferred through an intermediate step and not only you know with one account but 50 accounts right that's what they call uh, layering right rather than transferring money directly uh, you send it through this intermediate step that could for instance be, be a situation where somebody is working around a purchasing limit for instance right if if for instance this this uh, uh, wallet here was um, associated with a betting site with maybe a limit of, of ten dollars per bet right here somebody rather than you know who, who can't um, uh, use you know five hundred dollars in one go they would then just create 50 bets of, of ten dollars um, or it could be that somebody is just trying to obfuscate the origin of the money. But in both cases, this would be undesired patterns, right? And that's what they're trying to identify with their solution at Paysafe. The other thing here on the right-hand side is kind of similar uh, in that there's also primarily one source of the money, which is this guy here, and one sink, which is that guy. And then there's lots and lots and lots of transactions going back and forth between all of these accounts. And what this shows just clearly is that somebody is trying to hide a simple money transfer in large amounts of data, right? Clear indication that there's something fishy going on, right? These are the things which the Paysafe team um, identified in, in, in their data. And that's why graphs, graph technologies are so powerful for them in analyzing financial transactions, right? Okay. Now let me take a quick break and let me have a look at whether there's anything going on in the chat. Okay, nobody with any chat questions, comments, or whatever. Okay, <clears throat> then um, coming to what Oracle has to do with this. Okay, so to address these kinds of use cases which I've just been talking about, right? We've been offering graph technologies for a number of years, right? Initially, that was a paid option to the database, but as I mentioned, now it's available without additional charge, meaning if you have an Oracle database, there's really no, no reason not to use this functionality, right? And until last year, you had two options. You could either install the, what is known as the graph server and client kit on premises, or you could use it on the Oracle Cloud by installing the OCI Marketplace image. And that Marketplace image has you know, everything uh, pre-built. With that, you can then create your graph model from the relational data you had. You can perform graph analysis. You can use the tools like the Python client, the visualization tool, the Zeppelin-based notebook. I don't know if you've been on uh, Craig's um, session just a moment ago, uh, but that um, a session was also making use of notebooks extensively in the demo, right? And we can do the same thing working with the graph, except our notebook here is, is Zeppelin based and what uh, Craig was using was uh, um, Jupyter as a Python based, but any, anyway, so, same, same concept. Um, that, that's what we call our user managed offering. And before I forget, um, if you use either of these two user managed options, you can always use the latest graph servant client kit with your database, right? As long as you have a database 12.2 and above, you can use the graph uh, server and client kit. And with it, we are on a quarterly release cadence so that there's really no need to use the outdated 19.4 release just because you have a 19C database, right? What you should use is 22.3, which is our current release. And you can find it for download on uh, oracle.com here, right? Or you use the marketplace image, as I said. Now, since early last year, there's an, an, another option which we can offer you. <clears throat> and we've really um, tried to make it easy for you to get started with this. What we've developed is what we call Graph Studio in Autonomous Database, which is a complete graph database and analytics environment, and it's all ready to run, right? It's a feature of the autonomous database, which not only means that you that it uses the, the database as the persistence layer, but it, it is also uh, an integrated environment which 
we are managing for you. So it inherits all the, the self-driving, the self-securing, the self-repairing capabilities of the autonomous database, okay? So in addition, Craft Studio uh, includes a modeling tool that I'll show you in just a minute um, that helps you to turn relational tables into a graph. And it has a notebook-based environment which you can use to work with the graph and has the visualization included and so on. And of course, all of that sits on top of the graph analytics engine, which we've had out on the market for a number of years, okay? Good, now, as I said, I wanted to show you some things in practice, right? So uh, I think we're done with the introduction, uh, unless anybody's got any, qu anybody, any questions? Let me just quickly have a look at the chat. That's not the case. Um, I think we can move on to what I wanted to show you today. So what I've prepared for you is a, is a little demo scenario that starts in the relational world, right? In this case, in a fictitious financial services environment, right? Where we have two tables, like what, what we've got here on the slide, right? One table containing information about bank accounts, like you know, account number, account holder, and so on. And the other storing transactions between these accounts, right? Essentially, uh, the two account numbers and the amount of uh, money which is being moved between these two accounts, right? And the first thing I'll do with these tables is to convert them into a graph model. I'll briefly explain how that works in general, and then you know we'll look at um, what this looks like in practice. And once we're done with that, first thing we want to do is try to find circular payments. Right, like in this little graph here, right? Uh, so moving money moving from account two to 833 to 672 uh, and then back to two, right? And um, I'll try to explain what kind of pattern matching queries we can do in general, give you a little bit of an introduction to the query language, the PGQL, the property graph query language. Uh, and then again, we'll look at it live and then we'll move on to the graph algorithms, which I already touched on uh, a moment ago. Right? So in that case, what we want to do is to compute the distance from a given account, which has been identified as fraudulent, uh, by counting the hops essentially from that uh, account to a given vertex. Right, And we use that, you can use that metric very nicely uh, as an indicator for, for risk. Okay, so uh, to summarize, right, what we need to do is first create a graph from the relation tables then move the data to the appropriate data structures and memory perform the graph pattern matching, and we'll do that interactively, and finally execute um, uh, uh, the graph algorithms, in this case, the um, shortest path hop distance uh, algorithm, but you can know other things. Once you have understood the, the concept, it's, it's actually easy, right? And as I said, for the demo, we'll be using Graph Studio in autonomous database, right? You could potentially also use the graph server and client kit, so the user managed offering, but in that environment, you wouldn't have the, you know, the automation and you wouldn't uh, have the graph modeling tool and, and so forth. So you'd need to manually create the graph and I'll show you what that would look like in a moment. Good, so what I'm showing you today, that little demo scenario, we're currently working on making this entire demo scenario available as a as a so-called Live Labs workshop. I hope most of you, if not all of you, know the Live Labs platform, right? Comes, uh, you have all these these little workshops coming with step-by-step -step, um, instructions, right? Which would then allow you, after today's session, that you can easily try this out yourself, right? The link to the Live Labs platform is developer.oracle.com slash Live Labs. Um, and there's a bunch of workshops already there covering graphs. Not, not to mention the huge number of other workshops covering other te Oracle technologies. Um, and the, as I said, there is one using the bank transactions data set uh, already, uh, but as we've already, uh, as we've added a, a bunch of you know, great new features to the visualization, we needed to rewrite larger parts of that scenario and that is work which is still in progress. Good. Now, in the interest of time, uh, and as there's not nothing graph specific in the setup and everything, I, I will skip all the you know, creation of a cloud account and the um, uh, loading of data and, and all of that. I assume most of you have already done that previously. 
Good. So what do we need to do first? Well, first thing is we need to create a graph from relational tables. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have too much time because I also wanted to accommodate the section on graphs and machine learning in this talk. Um, we have a bunch of you know uh, training videos, or you can use the the live labs for more details on how to um, come from a relational um, environment to a graph. Uh, but maybe just quickly, right? Unlike in the relational world, a graph model is a bit different in that the model depends at least to some degree, on the kind of problem you're trying to solve. So there's, an, an, in, in relational theory, you know, have all the third normal form and everything. Um, that is not the case in the graph world. And there's typically more than one solution to mapping a relational um, environment to a graph. That's the one thing. And the second thing is actually not uncommon to also go back to the drawing board after the initial round of analysis, because during the initial round of analysis, you've discovered that maybe you want to use a slightly different graph model to start with, and then you go back and do that again. Um, like, for example, um, if you have a um, uh, an e-commerce website and you, 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 know, you have a table of customers, you have a table of products, uh, and they are like in in a in in like in the sales history schema if you know that uh, are connected through a sale right you can either model the customer as a vertex the product as a vertex and every sale could be an edge or you could also model that sale as a vertex which you can then you know use to connect to to other information like you know which store was that sale associated with maybe or something of that sort um, and um, uh, you know model it that way so, as I said there's no strict answer right um, one thing which is also different uh, you know if you come from a from a relational background uh, is, uh, is is if you have an end-to-end -end relationship like in the case of you know products and customers where one cust customer can purchase one or more products and a product is being purchased by zero or more customers, these end-to-end -end relationships in the relational world, you would need to model with an intermediate table. Right? In the graph world, you can just create a connection. You don't need the intermediate table. Uh, you can have a product connected to many customers and a customer connected to many products. That's no problem. Right? In any case, what you end up with in um, in our environment is you need to create a create property graph statement. And that's exactly what we've done here, right? Do we have a, a DDL statement like this one, right? Create property graph, uh, give the graph a name. And then we have uh, the tables which are then mapped to vertices in, in the graph, right? So here we have the, the customers and the products uh, which become vertices in the graph and the customers have a certain set of properties the products have a certain set of properties and every sale in this case we are modeling as an edge and an edge which has the customer as the source and the product as uh, the destination the label of that edge is purchased and then maybe we want to add something like you know quantity how many products did the customer uh, purchase Right. This is how we would come from a graph model to a, uh, sorry, from a relational model to a graph. Right, and I'll I'll show you what this looks like in practice. Let's see if I can get this uh, to to work. You should now hopefully see. Uh, let me see if I can get my. Uh, that's interesting. Can. Okay, I'm switching back and forth here. Let me see. Right now, you should actually see my screen. Do you? I hope you do. All right. Okay, here we are. So this is uh, Graph Studio in Autonomous Database. Let me see if my if my environment is still alive. Um, or if it's gone to sleep. So this this is essentially the, the landing page. This is where you you, you start. And um, when you when you first um, start up Graph Studio, 
right? And, and in order to do so, all you need is a, a user with the appropriate uh, privileges, right? Uh, again, that's all described in the in the live labs, for example. But coming back to the question of what do we need to do first? Okay, we need to model our graph first. Start modeling is what we want to do. And here you can see, aha, what are the tables that I can see? Well, I have my bank accounts table here, okay, and I have my transactions table here, right? And then let's have the modeler suggest a potential model. Now, what it does is it looks at the tables, it looks at the primary key, foreign key relationships, for example, and it suggests that, okay, bank accounts uh, could be vertices, Okay, that's good. Here we are. Maybe what we want to do is just call that um, um, that vertex type accounts and change that. Okay, and then we have the transactions. Uh, the transactions table would be mapped mapped to an edge. Right. Again, maybe you want to change the label to transfers because then it'll be what it's supposed to be uh, to have my notebook working and with that there's one more little change if you look here the source table is the bank uh, transactions table has an edge key and the source is bank transactions to account ID and the destination is bank transactions from account ID. No, that's not what we want. We want this the other way around. So we switch the, the, the direction because if you have money transfers, this is a directed transfer. It goes from an account to an account. Now that's correct. It goes from an account to an account. And what this thing does in the background now is it creates the create property graph statement uh, so you have the key, you have the label, you have the properties, just like you saw on, on the slide a moment ago. Okay, and now <clears throat> I could actually go and create that graph. In the interest of time, we're not gonna do that. Uh, I have already prepared that. Uh, we can make use of that graph in the notebook in just a second. But that, before we do that, let, let me briefly explain to you what we need to do first. Okay, let me see if I can switch back. Okay, you should now actually be able to see my sliding in. Yes, okay, I think that works. So that was the property graph uh, DDL, which we've just seen. Um, there's one more step which we need to do um, and that's to create the appropriate data structures, the appropriate data structures which we need to get the performance for the graph algorithms which we need, right? Uh, now, to, to generate these data structures, we have to retrieve the, the required data from the source tables, right? And in Graph Studio, the create, table, uh, the create property graph statement actually creates a set of metadata structures on the underlying table, kind of you know like a view, which is why we call this PG view. And with the help of these views, what we do is we load the data into memory, right? The resulting graph obviously reflects the schema of the graph, just like you know we have declared it in the create property graph statement, which also means that it is not schema less, right? Now, if you want to have a, if you really want to have a schema less graph, that's something we can also do. We, we, we have that option. What we, you would need to do is you can um, map your database tables to um, edge tables and vert, um, vertex tables. And these are fully schema less. And then from there, you can then load them into the appropriate uh, in memory data structures. In any case, we need to convert our data in tables into the appropriate in-memory data structures. And that is what gives us the uh, the performance. Okay? Right. I hope I haven't confused the hell out of everybody. Um, and now once we have these data structures, we can then start querying that graph. And in order to 
query that graph, uh, we need to have a graph pattern matching uh, query language. Now we, as Oracle, we've de uh, developed a, um, a language. That at the moment, there are no standards yet, but we just just we are very close to um, a an extension to the SQL language uh, called SQL PGQ, um, which will officially be published next year, but is now going through all the finalization and, and the ballots at the ISO uh, standards board. Uh, and then with that, uh, there will be a standard and it'll be very similar to what you see here, right? Because what we need to do is to identify graph patterns, obviously, in, in the graph, right? Um, to specify patterns there's two different kinds of patterns you, on the one hand you can have fixed length patterns or repetitive patterns of variable length length right and what we've done in order to allow this we have extended the sql constructs which you all know that you know select from where group by and so on with a match clause for that purpose, right? The idea is really to make it easy for SQL developers to also develop graph queries. Now to modify the graph, there are insert and update and delete statements. And, and you've already seen the create property graph statement a moment ago, which is kind of the DDL part in this. Um, if, you, if you're interested in all the details, right? Here's, here's the, the URL to the language specification that has a lot of examples also, it's pretty, useful reference for anybody who wants to work in in that space right here's a couple of you know um, example of uh, examples of, of uh, pgql clauses right using the match clause is actually pretty intuitive from from my point of view right it's a bit like ascii art what we're doing is we're using parentheses to represent vertices in the graph pattern and square brackets to represent edges, right? Edges which are then connected to the vertices by pointers. And these pointers like uh, like here, right? They indicate a direction. Or you can have um, uh, situations where you're explicitly ignoring uh, the, the directions, right? And then we have, you know, simple patterns uh, where, you know, uh, you, you have um, uh, the um, the like the vertex type specified or the edge type uh, specified um, or uh, you know you, you can um, uh, already start doing recursive patterns where you have more than one edge of type transfer right zero or more this this is like the, the Keeney star here uh, which indicates okay you have zero or more transfers between uh, a and B and B starting from a given vertex uh, or account number, in this case, uh, 47, 11. Uh, and in a similar way, uh, I can uh, search for you know, one or more uh, hops or a minimum or a, a, a number of or whatever, right? These variable length paths, they only return the start and end vertex. So if I want to retrieve the vertices in between uh, up to PGQL version 1.3, I actually need to explicitly specify them, you know, like what we did here. But uh, starting with uh, PGQL 1.4, it became possible to access these edges in between, perform aggregations and create lists and, and, and so forth, right? We have now this one row per vertex or one row per step uh, clause, which gives this in, in list form, right? There's a bunch of other constructs like, you know, shortest path, any shortest path, all shortest paths, top K shortest paths and, and, and so forth, which in the interest of time, I'm not going to go uh, into a um, couple of additional language constructs. So at the bottom, you can see an example of, you know, uh, a relatively simple, but pretty powerful PGQL query where you're trying to find all ancestors uh, of um, two given people, all the common ancestors, right? So you go up a, a, a hierarchy and try to find all uh, common ancestors. This is what this query uh, allows you to do. And if you if you want to do something of that sort in SQL, it's an interesting exercise. It, you could, of, of course, you can do it, but it's not it's recursive and it's not trivial, right? So these PGQL queries are actually pretty compact and therefore easy to maintain. So that's the queries, and then. 
besides the query language, we have support for lots and lots of algorithms. We've, got, we've implemented over 60 algorithms in the meantime for ranking, for community detection, for pathfinding, uh, and so forth. And all of these algorithms are parallelized to the degree that they can be parallelized, right? Um, so if you compare that to other graph databases, you'll find that they just scale extremely well. I have one example here, which is the, the page rank um, algorithm, which you may know from uh, from the Google search results, right? Page rank is what uh, Larry Page came up with uh, in order to um, order the, the the search results of a Google search. And the idea is that those search results, which are most important, which are particularly important, they come up first. Uh, and what makes a web page important? Well, it's if you have many um, links to it, right? And uh, he does the analysis in a recursive way. If you have a page which is directly linked off a, an important page, like here, you have this, maybe this is you know, oracle.com and you have that web page uh, connected to it, that becomes more important because this is a page with, with lots of links to it and lots of traffic on it. And that makes the other one, even if it has only a very small number of, of links, makes that more important. This is essentially the, how, how the, the page rank uh, algorithm uh, works. And it's you know one of the examples which you can use to find important vertices in your graph, right? If you wanna run these algorithms, uh, uh, we are actually offering two APIs. We have a Java API, we have a Python API. Um, and what they would do is they add the results as new properties to the graph, right? This can be a measure like page rank. Uh, this can be a number, like if you do community detection, this is, you know, this vertex is part of community one, community two, community three, and so forth. Or it can be like even a vector uh, uh, reflecting the embedding of a, uh, of, of a, um, vertex if, if we use the um, algorithms like like deep walk which we need for machine learning for instance I'll, I'll talk about that again in, in just a minute right now before we come to the the the, um, the actual demo uh, just one quick comment about the client software right on premises uh, we have a JShell client we have a Python client you can use you know Jupyter notebooks the Zeppelin notebook is part of our offering anyway what we have on the cloud in Graph Studio is the different interpreters. We have a Java interpreter uh, for the different notebook paragraphs. We have a Python interpreter. Uh, we have a SQL interpreter um, and so forth, right? Uh, so let me, uh, rather than talking about, let me show you what, what this actually looks like. And in order to do that, I need to go back to the demo again. So I hope you can, I hope you can see the demo, right? This is what the note, if you've seen Craig's presentation a moment ago, you, you'll be familiar with uh, notebooks. This is essentially uh, what the notebook environment looks like in Graph Studio, right? <clears throat> so you, say you, you have a, a, a run paragraph button here, and like we can, we can um, run the first paragraph, which is a Python paragraph, which essentially just checks if if my graph is loaded into the uh, in, uh, appropriate in-memory uh, data structures. And remember, we had the model where we have the bank transactions and um, the every vertex was an account and every edge was a transfer between these accounts, right? This is a simple PGQL query here, which you can, uh, which you can see. Uh, it just picks a random set of 100 vertices, and I can now you know, have a have a closer look at at these right here are the the different um, uh, source vertices um, and the different transfers going out. I can I can click on them. Like if if I look at this guy, right, this is a bank account 415, uh, and uh, I can click on. The other one, this is you know, another banking or whatever, right? So I can play around with that graph in an interactive way in the interest of time. I'm not going to do that in, in, in more detail. But what I wanted to show you is that we can now search for circular payments, right? Starting with an account A and then going through 
the number of transfers here, maybe between one and four, to uh, account D, and then from D again to B, with A being the same as B. This is what you can run, and then you can see these paths, in this case, uh, starting at an account which I interactively enter here. This is account 534, that's the guy down here in the middle, right? Money goes from here to here to here to here to there, for example. So you can interactively look at how the money flows and uh, maybe to find interesting accounts, one thing we can do is to look at the number of transfers, ingoing and outgoing. If you list this, now this is what it looks like. I'm speeding up a little bit because I'm a bit conscious of time here. Uh, now coming to the actual circular payments, right, we can now try to find all those cases where we have um, trans, and I'm not, I'm not only looking at one circular path, but all shortest or all paths between, from A through a number of edges up to four hops to B with A being the same as B. And that gives us a situation where starting at this account here, which is 934, we can go from here to here to here to there, and again from here to here to here to there. So you can see how the money flows. And this is clearly suspicious because there are three situations with four uh, uh, transfers where money goes out from this account and then lands back in the account. Uh, that is something which you would uh, uh, you know, typically see in money laundering. We can do this with more steps and, and so on. Uh, again, in the interest of time, let's let's just jump over that. So these kinds of suspicious patterns, we can use them to identify accounts which are you know dubious, right? That clearly, you know, that looks suspicious. And let's assume that in the fraud department we have actually determined this that this account 934 is involved or has been involved in illegal activities. What we now want to do is uh, to look at where did the money go from this account 934? Because chances are that the, the accounts which are close to or which have you know, received money from account 934, they are also potentially also part of that scheme, right? And again, there may be accounts which have received money, which have then passed on the money to again further accounts, um, which are you know still close to account 934, but not directly connected. They they are probably also involved or could potentially be involved in the scheme. The closer the account to the account 934, the higher the risk that uh, it is part of the fraud scheme, right? And this we can actually use as a fraud indicator, right? We can use that to calculate uh, a, um, a potential risk by looking at how many hops away from account 934 is a given vertex. And there is a, an algorithm, the shortest path hop dist algorithm, which if you give it a starting vertex, like 934 in our case, calculates the number of hops from that starting vertex um, if there is a connection at all, right? And we can run this, and this is how we would perform graph or execute graph algorithms, right? We can uh, run the algorithms by, first of all, getting um, a handle on the graph in Python here is, what we, uh, is, is how we do this, right? So we have a, a handle on the graph. Okay, it needs to wake up again. And then all we need to do is run the shortest path hop distance algorithm. There we go. And you could already see that if you look at uh, the bottom right corner of that paragraph. That was actually, uh, OK, this this needed a little moment to wake up, but this was running in like 700 milliseconds or something. This is not a, not a big graph, but I did this, this exercise, the shortest hop path distance just uh, last week with a graph of 218 million vertices. And what do you think? How long did it take? Shortest path hop distance from a given starting point took four seconds. So, um, and that was not on outlandish hardware; it was on a on a two O CPU cloud based system, right? And then you can do all kinds of calculations, like how many uh, how many accounts are 
um, zero hops away. Okay, that, that's just one because that's 934. Five are directly connected and then 24 are connected to these five and then 102 connected to these 24. And, and so you can see the number of hops going up, right? Anyway, I think we can we can actually use that uh, as a risk indicator, right? And and increase the size uh, by you know, using highlights here. But again, I'm I'm short of time, so i in order not to go overboard with with time, uh, I need to wrap up at this point. I hope I've at least given you a bit of an idea, and then let me quickly go back to my presentation. Right, I hope you can see my slides. Yes, we're back to the algorithms we've talked about. That so I hope I've I've at least given you an, an idea of how to create a graph model, then what we need to do is create, uh, populate, populate the, the appropriate data structures, and then you can perform interactive graph queries or execute algorithms, right? We've seen all of that. Now, just briefly on graphs and machine learning before we are in, uh, running out of time entirely. Um, as you just saw, right, I, I computed a kind of risk score on the basis of uh, the distance from that given bank account. And it's probably already obvious to you that you can use uh, the output of that analysis as input to some uh, machine learning platform. Could be like OML, for example, right? Taking it into account these kind of indirect relationships, that'll help you to significantly improve the accuracy of your predictions, because otherwise they go unnoticed, okay? and. Of course, you can also do the, op the opposite, right? You can use the results of a machine learning model, which maybe predicts either new properties or predicts additional edges even, right? You can add that to your graph and then perform further analysis on that. What at Paysafe, what they're doing is uh, they have what, what all the banks have. They have a rules engine that uh, looks at um, an incoming transaction and then has to decide, okay, am I going to process that, that thing automatically or am I going to reject it? And what it does is it checks if there's any indirect connection to a f an account which has been involved in fraudulent activity in the past. And when I say indirect connection, I mean up to three hops away. And it also uh, computes a risk score using the machine learning platform. And the machine learning platform is actually fed from graph structures also. I mean, there's there, there's either uh, KPIs coming from the graph, like every vertex uh, gets a KPI, but you can also do that in a more sophisticated way. And I'm sorry that we're running a bit out of time here, but what you would really need to do is to uh, capture the structure of the graph in such a way that the machine learning model can ingest it. And there are algorithms, DeepWalk, for example, is one of them that actually helps you to convert the graph structure into a vertex, preserving the topology of the graph so that two vertices which are close in the graph are uh, also close in, you know, in this n-dimensional in in vector space, right? Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over that, uh, which explains that in a little more detail uh, in order to just wrap up just before the top of the hour. Uh, so I, I hope that in these few minutes, I've given you at least a bit of an idea of what graph technologies are about, right? I hope it's become clear that graph technologies are a different view on your existing data, right? And that they are complementary to relational technologies. They are particularly well suited for paths, for hierarchies, for you know, connection networks and, and, and so on. Uh, and um, you can use the results of your graph analysis as input to machine learning, for instance. And we as Oracle, what we've got is um, the graph features as an integral part of the Oracle database. So you don't need anything else. Uh, we, uh, the, the offering comes with you know, the modeling tool, the graph visualization, the, the notebooks and stuff. And all of that is built on the in-memory analytics engine with all of the algorithms and the uh, SQL-like pattern matching query language, right? Good. So where where can you find more information? Well, there's a, of course, there's the product page. Uh, if you want to get your hands dirty, I, I do recommend the Live Labs. Uh, we have um, a dedicated blog. 
um, on, on this, although we're in the process of migrating to the database insider blog, which is where you'll find more. There's also, if you look at look for the tag Oracle Graph, there's also uh, blog posts on medium.com, for example, or videos on the Ask Tom series. We have our YouTube channel, or you could follow us on Twitter and so forth, right? And if you have a chance, uh, um, and if you can attend Oracle Cloud World, you'll find a number of sessions on graph technologies at Oracle Cloud World. So I hope uh, that we'll be seeing you there. And with that, we've got one more minute to go, um, which leaves us one minute for questions. Um, anybody, any any questions, feel free to stick them into the chat. Or Fabian, uh, anything from your side, maybe? I take that as a no. OK, with that, then, uh, thank you very much for attending. I appreciate your participating in my little introduction to graph technologies. I hope it's been useful. And uh, I hope to see you at Cloud World, if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Eh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Eh, bueno, de nuestro apreciado público, si hay alguna pregunta para Hans, está allí dispuesto el chat para que nos la puedan dar. Por allí ya un, uno de nuestros participantes nos dice thank you very much. Y bueno, estamos esperando si hay alguna pregunta para Hans, si no ya para dar por cerrada nuestra sesión. Una gran conferencia. Thank you, Hans. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bueno, creo que todo ha sido eh, muy claro en la charla, sobre todo todos los temas en relación de cómo en algún momento el Machine Learning puede eh, aplicarse, puede trabajarse, puede realmente hacer grandes desarrollos en relación con lo que son los servicios financieros mientras, eh, mediante el análisis gráfico. Y de esta manera damos por culminada nuestra conferencia de nuestro gran invitado Hans Bielmatt, eh, les esperamos que continúen participando en, en todas nuestras otras charlas que aún tenemos programadas. Les deseamos una excelente tarde, un excelente eh, fin de semana. Hasta luego. Salón. Con mucho gusto.